Okay, so we're now, we're now live, right, Wendy? Hmm. Yes. Okay. Great. Uh, I can't see. I I still can't see the participants. Should I change my? I only see one person joining. Hi, Jenny. Okay. Oops. Um, okay, I, I guess we, we're going to begin. Uh, I see some people again joining us. Please feel free to... Hi, Sammy. Hello, hello, everyone. Hello, hello. Hey, we, Sammy. We're not worried about you, but you're here. Oh, I had I had another <laughs> class on Zoom I was doing. Oh, no worries, no worries. I just finished um, it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was just saying to all our attendees, please join the meeting, Unmute, uh, turn on your video cams, and at any point in time, feel free to participate in the conversation. So I'm going to begin officially. I'm going to um, be welcoming everyone here and just uh, some housekeeping items and some acknowledgments, if you would allow me. So Welcome to No Summary. This is Golden Threads Online Conversations with artists who don't fit in a box. My name is Sahara Asaf. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Executive Artistic uh, Director of Golden Thread Productions. And by way of visual description, I'm an Arab woman with a light complexion and brown hair, and I'm wearing a navy blue blazer with a black top underneath, and behind me is a plain white wall. Um, for those of you who don't know, Golden Thread is the first American theater company devoted to theater from or about the Middle East. And we were founded by playwright and director Taranji Aghazarian in 1996. I would like to take a moment here to acknowledge the people of the land on which we live and work today, the multiple Ohlone tribes, Despite the atrocities of colonization and genocide, native communities persist today and are active in efforts to preserve and revive their culture. At Golden Thread, we are driven by a desire to expand this land acknowledgement statement to recognize our community's experience of occupation in the Middle East, the refugee crisis, and the displaced population. This today is our first No Summary for 2023, which is our fourth season of this program. And in this new season, No Summary embarks on a virtual tour to universities across the nation, bringing Golden Threads conversations with artists who don't fit in a box to theater and art classes. So it's like a um, um, class visit made public, basically. So I'm so thrilled to be launching this year's series with our artist in residence, Wafa Bilal, joined by the classes and some students from the classes of Associate Professor and Cultural Historian, Simon Anderson, uh, at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and uh, students from the classes of interdisciplinary artist, Sami Hussein Asmat at Columbia College Chicago, and also at the School of the Art Institute in Chicago. So, Welcome, all of you, and thank you for being here. Um, our guest speaker today, uh, allow me to make it a little also official of an introduction and read a little bit of uh, Wafa's bio for those of you who might not be so familiar with his brilliant work. Um, Wafa is an um, Iraqi-born artist and arts professor at NYU, NYU Stitch School of the Arts. Um, he's known internationally for his online performative and interactive works provoking dialogue about international and interpersonal politics. His work explores tensions, as he would like to put it, between the cultural spaces he occupies, his home in the comfort zone of the US and his consciousness in the conflict zone in Iraq. For his 2007 installation, Domestic Tension, Bilal spent a month in flat file galleries where people could shoot him via a remote access paintball gun. The Chicago Tribune called it one of the sharpest works of political art to be seen in a long time, naming him 2008 Artist of the Year. 
That year, City Lights published Shoot an Iraqi Art, Life, and Resistance oh, under the gun about Bilal's life and about domestic tension. Using his own body as a medium, Bilal continued to challenge the public's comfort zone with projects like Third Eye and, and Counting. His work can be found in the permanent collections of the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, Museum of, of Contemporary Photography in Chicago, Matthaf Arab Museum of Modern Art in Doha, Qatar, amongst others. He holds a BFA from the University of New Mexico and MFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and is currently, as I said, an arts professor at NYU Stitch School. Um, Wef is also our artist in residence. We're so honored. And he will collaborate with us on multiple projects throughout the year, including the curation of Amrika, the comedy show. Uh, and also he will be contributing to the Reorient Forum this fall. And just allow me also like to just say one thing about this artist in residence program because it's a brand new initiative at Golden Thread. And the aim is to engage guest artists on an annual basis within the company staff. So the program intends to bring fresh perspectives into each season and also expand the culture of innovation and creativity while allowing the guest artists the opportunity to grow their work and engage with our communities. Um, again, I'm so honored to be launching this new program with you, Wafa. Welcome, ahla sahla. Thank you so much, uh, Sahar. And uh, I wanted to say I'm really thrilled to be working with you and uh, working with the Golden uh, Threat with a great opportunity uh, it is uh, very unusual with with me to cross cross path to the theater world, but I'm sure there is a great connection here. There is, and we're going to be talking about it yes. for sure. Um, so this um, conversation today is the title of the conversation is um, uh, comedy as a form of resistance. So we're going to be diving into why Wafa Bilal is. Um, doing something like a stand-up comedy, like curating a stand-up comedy. Uh, before we do that, I want to uh, welcome those in the room again, um, and also those of you who are tuning into the live stream on HowlRound. So those who are with us in the room, please feel free at any point to utilize the chat function and post your comments and questions throughout the conversations. Uh, feel free also to introduce yourselves in the chat as well. Um, we're going to be sharing the biographies of our speakers also in the chat for you to have um, a deeper look at them. Um, so those who know Wafa's work, like like I do, might might have been surprised to know that you're the curator of a comedy show, like I was. I, I mean, when we started this conversation, Wafa, about what to do during this residency with us, I was literally expecting anything <laughs> except comedy. But it was such a happy surprise for me because at Golden Thread, we, we were really looking for opportunities to allow us to spread laughter amongst our communities. You're an artist who have used your body, used technology, virtual reality, like many platforms, many mediums, I mean, to, as, as, you, as you put it, to trigger a platform. Like to name a few examples, You've surgically installed a camera into your skull for a year. You put your body and soul in front of a web activated paintball gun for like six weeks in domestic tension. You had an Iraqi memorial permanently tattooed on your back in and counting. So as a theater maker and firm believer in the power of storytelling, I find it extremely interesting that you say America, the stand-up comedy show, does the, th the same thing, basically it triggers a platform. So I would like to invite you to begin, start us on this conversation by talking about this. How do, you know, how does your work, you know, uh, the kind of work that you do and comedy come together by triggering oh, a platform? Uh, Sarah, Sarah, thank you so much. Um, when I looked at comedy, um, it really it bring me back uh, so many years to the childhood. And uh, I wasn't aware uh, of its power 
the power of laughter, the power of the very basic of it as a, is a, is a joke. Um, but then when we, um, uh, 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 to begin with, we try to analyze it, right? Uh, what's the basic of it? Uh, in order to laugh at something, specifically a joke, you do need um, a basic thing. You need to be informed of a situation. You have to have a network of things. You have to have a reference to things, whether it's politics, whether it's social, whether it's a mundane thing. So uh, things we practice every day, but we don't really know the mechanism about it. So uh, uh, let's say I'm saying a joke, but what I'm really doing, uh, that joke, it would never re resonate unless there is a connection between me and the people I'm telling that joke. So we could see immediately that form is building a community. And that's what interests me to begin with, how a laughter build a community. But let's break it more down, go to the childhood. I lived in Iraq when I was uh, a child under Saddam regime, and I lived through multiple wars. Uh, let's not talk about the oppression of the regime, we'll just talk about the wars, for example. Uh, Iran, Iraq war, Iran, uh, Kuwait, uh, Iraq, uh, Kuwait war. Um, within the war tend to dehumanize people because it's insignificant. Uh, uh, the destruction doesn't discriminate um, whether it's a human or an object, then it becomes a form of oppression. How do you fight that back? How do you uh, say, I'm a human, I exist, but I am not existing alone. So it become empowered. And I remember uh, the childhood memories all punctuated with uh, laughter, whether is uh, during bombing or whether during uh, uh, the embargo uh, or during uh, an, uh, a harsh day. Why that is important? Um, I think it's, it's important because it pulls us together as a group of people, it empower us, then it enable us to fight back. Then we go back, well, how is it laughter making us fighting back, for example? Uh, as I mentioned, I live under Saddam's regime. And as a group of teenager, uh, this is, this is, the 70s, the 80s, uh, forget about uh, uh, your phone, forget about the internet, forget about even TV, phone. What it was, it was us teenager trying to prevail over an oppressive regime. How do you do that? By breaking its power it through uh, minimizing its psychological effect. What did we do? We establish an underground, call it a comedy club, but really it's a joke that is built by people and disseminated, disseminated by people underground. So we would tell jokes about the regime to undermine its power and its effect on our mentality. Uh, this way, not only we feel we are living, but we are in power too. And how did we do it? Uh, our parents always told us, be careful when you live under an oppressive regime because the, the walls have ears. 
as kids, we took it literally, the, war, the, the wolves have ears, they're listening, right? So we would tell each other, meet me at that intersection. I have a new joke for you. And we would walk to the intersection. Why the intersection? Because we were afraid of any wolves. We were afraid of any enclosure, any, anybody who could hear us. We were even afraid of people from a distance. So we will distance ourselves. We will come to tell the joke. Of course, it was directly about the regime, about the leader of the regime, and then we will walk away. That continued for so many people under oppression in, in Iraq. And that practice to this day, uh, I remember one day, and it was really uh, when around, uh, 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 when the civil war about to break uh, in, in Iraq, uh, uh, around uh, uh, 2000, uh, uh, seven, eight, I think that's when I did domestic tension. When the joke it dried up in Iraq, and that's the first time I realized the culture is in danger because for the first time, the politics and the situation is way more than a human could bear to the point Iraqi cannot laugh. And that's when you know the culture is in danger when they cannot laugh at politics. I'll stop for now. Thank you so much, uh, Wafa, for, for the story. And um, yeah, I remember reading this, this bit. It was very um, striking for me in, um, to shoot an, shoot an Iraqi when, when you speak about it. And I actually highlighted this part where you're talking about how um, the fact that Iraqis are not able to laugh is deeply disturbing because it kind of gives you, it means that they've entered, you say, a mode of complete hopelessness. Um, so I, I do have a follow-up question on this, but before, before I do that, I want to turn to our um, guest uh, speakers also here who are bringing their students to join us. So I'm going to um, turn to you, Simon. Hello and welcome. We're so happy to have you. Um, please, you know, feel free to comment. I want to ask you like whatever resonated uh, from what Wafa shared with us uh, and also tell us a little about your work and uh, the students that might be joining us here today. Uh, some of Some of your students, I believe, are here. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Zaha. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to engage with this fascinating concept. Um, and thank you, Wafa, for remembering the old school. Um, and uh, so I, I come at the idea of humour from my own uh, area of interest wherein the work of art was deliberately made to be sometimes a gag, a visual gag or a, a, a kind of conceptual one-liner. Um, so I learned very early that the, uh, that the idea of a work of art can be simply to flip your ideas around and maybe humor um, is a very good way of doing that. And hopefully for those people who are uh, in, in the room as well, the Friday afternoon crew um, will uh, will acknowledge that I'm not making that up. Um, so I find humor to be a very powerful thing. And first of all, uh, Wafa, I wanna thank you for that story. Man, that was harsh. <laughs> Um, uh, but I'm grateful uh, to have heard it. And I want to say that although it can never um, scar the psyche as much, that humor works in a similar way um, in, in the individual psyche. Mm -hmm. In other words, that it sets up these situations where um, uh, 
where, for instance, you know, is it safe to tell this joke? Um, is that joke going to offend someone else? And maybe even the joke itself is about um, a clash of oppositions. Um, so that's what I'm interested in, in thinking about. And because I'm a historian, I'm thinking about it as a historical thing. And so um, I know it goes back a long way. Thank you so much, Sam. And I just want to mention something about what you just said. And I wanted to refer everybody to what the futurists did uh, around before World War, uh, the first war, and in their opposition toward the use comedy as a form of resistance. So I highly recommend uh, people um, uh, read about that and what the futurists and other people have done in form of performance are taking it to the public to undermine and to resist uh, war. Yeah, thank you both. I mean, historically speaking, in the theater also, like it goes back to, you know, the ancient Greeks, right, with Aristophanes comedies telling us a lot about what was happening politically and socially and even in like how the theater, we learn a lot about how theater functioned through these comedies and it was like kind of mandatory to add the satyr plays within the, the you know, uh, tragic trilo trilogies. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's interesting. Let's see, Sami, how how is it for you? Where where do you where does your work intersect with do, do you do comedies in your work to begin with? I'm not <laughs> sure. <laughs> it, laughter? It, 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 it could be up up to interpretation. I think um uh, part of part of the tactics um uh, that that I, I started to use by by being here is to to play in to play in this realm of like fiction and nonfiction and the real and not real. And that that could that could end up being comic depending on who you are performing in front of and what what type of audience. I mean, it's funny, I was I was reading the other day that the that the global south, they know a lot about themselves and their political sit situation, and they also know about people in Europe and in America. But people in America and Europe barely know about themselves and their political <laughs> situation, right? Which is, you know, which which is, I I think this is the kind of realm I play at, and where where I'm coming from over here. And sometimes that could be comic. Sometimes that could be comic. I don't think I go with the intention of it being comic, but it it, it does sometimes end up being comic for sure. And um. If I may, I'd, I mean, I'd I'd like to call on my students in in the chat just to just to comment if if you all can on what what does it mean for you in relation to the work we have been doing with me or with other like with other professors, what does it mean for you to trigger a platform, mm -hmm. and then what what's important about humor in relation to your work. And if you want to introduce yourself, as, as Sahar said, please do, right? So in the chat, and then maybe, maybe Sahar, if we have time, a couple of them can be invited to speak, if that's... Oh, absolutely. That's yeah. the whole idea. I'd love yeah. for them to speak. I see lots of nods, and um, I see Sophia, Jenny, Maya, forgive me if I'm mispronouncing the names, but feel free to unmute, uh, use the ha the raise hand function at any point or add your question in the chat, but we really would love to hear your voices. So um, just, yeah. And, and Wendy, keep an eye with me on if I don't see, like I'm not able to see everyone, I don't know for some reason, but if people raise their hands, just give me a sign. Um, anyone, any question from the room before we move on? Something, some, something very, very relevant. I know the graduate yeah. students are working on on the on an adaptation of the Bakai, and each of them are individually really triggering a platform in relation to the Bakai, and there is comedy in it. So, any any of the graduate students, please, like, if you want to talk about that, that I think that that would be a great entry point for you into the discussion, as well. While we're still loitering in the ancient past, I want to uh, thank you, Sahar, for the mention of 
Aristophanes uh, because I think, you know, uh, Cloud Cuckoo Land um, is a place that is still around and thrown around as a kind of political fantasy. And it's interesting to think about the way that those humorous terms can be kind of thrown around and used as weapons or alternatively can be kind of mirrored and and used as a form of defense um i don't know i think wafar probably as someone who's been a target more than most of us you might want to you might have something to say about that but really it's just an idea about how that sort of especially in in stand up i think when you're there alone yeah. and you are the yeah focus that must have a kind yeah. of psychic uh uh effect um this is a good time i think to talk about uh how uh, perhaps the performance is linked to stand up comedy um and again uh, breaking down the mechanism of it. Uh, Stand-up comedy is, um, I've been observing it for so many years, and I think uh, that is why I decide to uh, uh, produce it um, uh, in, in a form of this show. If we think about performance uh, and the power of it, the performance is one medium that is not mediated, very similar to theater, very similar to stand-up comedy, if it's live, of course. And what do I mean by um, unmediated? Unmediated is not carried by another medium, right? So our thoughts, as an artist, we, we take a, a thought, uh, and then we assign it as a value to an object, to uh, uh, to an act, and that become a form of, of art. So a medium carry out that, whether it's a sculpture, whether it's a digital art, whether it's a painting, it really doesn't matter. We have a form of art that doesn't need a medium. The medium could be every one of us, it could be the body. So. If it's unmediated, where the power of that form comes from, it's from its immediacy. And that is some powerful thing. Why? Because as a living being, we have, we are affected not only by our thoughts and um, our uh, cognitive uh, 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 power, but also our bodies have its own languages. We thinking about it that way. Then performance theater and stand up had its immediacy, its effect on the viewers, on the participant that is engaged in that place, in that time. And I think we perhaps agree why these three forms of art, it's hard to replicate them in on the record. It's hard to, you could archive them, but their effect it would never be the same because they intended to be immediate and had effect on the viewer with the performance stand up and you could see why artists and theater stand up choose that form in the time of upheaval, whether it's political or social, because they needed the immediacy, they needed to establish a platform, they needed to trigger. What do they need to trigger? They needed to trigger a response, regardless of the objective, here we're not passing any moral judgment on the artist. No, we're just uh, breaking down the mechanism of things, right? So what is all, again, more in common they have? They have 
somebody who triggered the platform or a group of people who triggered the platform, they have a platform, then they have the audience. And I think that is now where we question how effective the work is. When it comes to art, we should never pass a judgment if this is um, good or bad art, right? Or no, if this is good art or not. This is not up to us. The question is, is it effective or it is not? And I think its effectiveness come from how informed the performer is. In form of what? In form of the subject matter, in form of two important elements, objective of the piece, but one of the most important element, the audience, right? How do you want your audience to engage in and what's the objective of the entire performer, performance? When we break all of these down, I think it is easy for us to see the link between these three um, uh, form of art, right? Now, come back to Simon, facing the crowd alone. It's never easy. If you ever stood on the, that platform, regardless of the platform, you see and you feel the energy, right? Coming towards you. Then it is really up to you as a performer. How do you use that energy to serve your objective? This is not an easy task, but trust me, it is, it gets easier and easier and easier with the practice. Because we stand as a performer, we, we, we develop the tools to understand the situation. Uh, we build to understand the objective and to deliver it by using the energy of the audience themselves. And, and I think the more you see uh, stand-up comedian are some of the best at it because people are throwing things at them most of the time. Stand-up comedian are able to get under people's skin. The objective there is to agitate, to in and hair agitation is a form of engagement. It's antagonism. When you antagonize somebody, you don't want them to go away. You want them to engage. And stand-up comedian use it. Visual artists use it. Theater use it too. So then what happened when you're standing alone antagonize people and things thrown at it. Then you have to be quick. Either you anticipated that already or you are really quick at engaging people in the artist's objective and its outcome. Which I think, uh... Wafa is where humor comes in, right? Because it's a very yeah. rapid way to make a group of people cohere and also to a certain extent to disempower them, right? I mean, sometimes Absolutely. someone tells you a joke and you don't want to laugh, but you can't help it, right? Because <laughs> it's so stupid. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. And so and this it, is a great point. Um, I, I, I just... Uh, 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 bring you an example from a real life. I did a project called the Virtual Jihad, right? In Troy, where the government in the United States shut it down twice within a few days. And it really was about 
uh, uh, aggression in video games against Middle East, right? And I describe myself, I did nothing except holding a mirror reflecting a social condition, right? But that reflection didn't go very well. Why? Because people saw their own reflection and the picture was not very good. So I took that and then I exaggerated. I built my avatar as a medieval warrior with a suicide belt. It made no sense, right? But you see where the comedy start coming in. That already broke the tension. What is this thing? It doesn't make sense. And that's where comedy break any tension in the service and allowed us the entry for a conversation. Not many other things could do that, right? Yeah, and that is the power of stand-up comedy and the power of the single element of comedy, which is a joke. Fantastic. I, I love that. In in your description of America, Wafa, you say almost like the same thing. Uh, it, and I'm going to be reading from our synopsis, which is on the website. This cathartic and witty vending, venting holds a mirror up to reality, showing it has become so absurd and surreal. One must la laugh, if not cry. So in essence, it's doing the same thing, right? Like we're just reflecting. We're not, you know... Uh, necessarily trying to change things as much as we're just like inviting audiences to come and look at reality and the, the status quo. Yeah, it's true, Sarah. I mean, how did, uh, I'm sure um, we need to look at just like how America come to become a reality why a stand-up comedy show as a form of art, especially for me, yeah. um, when I left Chicago in 2008, um, uh, I, I really loved that city uh, in Chicago. It allowed me uh, the spiritual and the physical space to think and do things. Come to New York is completely the opposite. It's rush, rush, rush. There is no physical or mental space. So. While I'm in my small office or living space, I take a breather and I live in the village. And the breather is, I would go to these underground um, stand-up uh, uh, comedy clubs, right? And it remind me of what happened during my childhood and how so many comedians come to hear their grievances alive to other people as a form of living, right? They're not asking for money at all. These are one, one profession in the United States who doesn't want money, money uh, for, for performing is stand-up comedian. And I think I used that in, 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 at the Guggenheim Museum performance. But going, going, going back to America, then come a moment, and I don't want it to um, uh, be specific because I said I don't want it to politicize laughter, but laugh at politics. A shift in American United States politics made it a lot harder for us as a community. What I mean by us, not only Middle Eastern um, community who are not served, you know, from any uh, minority community in the United States, it come very clear to me, it become very clear we needed to establish a platform to complain. And that complain. It's a form of comedy and the complaint itself, it would be the glue to bring not to the reason to bring us together 
and to unite us, to give us the power and to make us visible. It's not just about power. We all talk about power, but I think the most powerful thing for us to do sometimes when we don't have uh, the power is the visibility. And I really thought this is a very simple idea, but it has a tremendous power. So myself and a couple of friends in New York City, we decided, why don't we do our own stand-up comedy show, invited all the disfranchised friends or the people we like when we just go to, to other uh, comedy clubs and see what happened. And it, it did. And we were really surprised. We brought very small uh, uh, group of stand-up comedian and we uh, ask a place like, can you let us do this? It was uh, Duda Cafe, I think Upper West Side, the first one. And it was an amazing hit. Politics in the environment, uh, 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 political environment, how us needed that form to come over a drink and a bite and talk to each other, catch up, it helped. And I think it gave also an amazing uh, a platform to the comedian themselves to laugh at politics. It, it's a very powerful platform that I remember in one of our chats, Wafa, as producers, you're like, tell the comedians, if you don't, if they don't send you the whatever you need, you're gonna, you know, you're paying them in minutes, you're gonna, you know, subtract some of the minutes they have on stage. Um, yeah, so so guys, just if you don't know the uh, just like much about uh, stand up uh, comedian uh, here in the village, um, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, under uh, uh, there are a lot of comedy clubs. Um, uh, some of the form called bringers, which is uh, if you ever walk around and people handing you flower and saying, "Hey, comedy club, a comedy show, come in." These are the comedian themselves bringing in people to the show. For every person they bring, they get a minute of time, right? So when Sahar told me, the comedian are not turning their W9 forms or not signing contract, I said, Sahar, please. Tell them for every day they are not signing, they are losing a minute of their time. That's getting scared, you know, so. Uh, yeah. Uh, I want to I want to up, uplift some of the comments we're having from students in the chat and please feel free again to you know speak directly with Wafa or your professors here Sophia zooming from Chicago in Sammy's class and I'm going to be uh, you know uh, skipping some parts here just because we're short on time it's never enough uh, I'm an actor that focuses on comedy so this subject that is close to my heart, I think comedy can give power back to the artist and audience, allowing them to laugh and find relief in community. I also think it's easier to get people behind um, visiting a comedy show than the more serious platforms. Laughter is cathartic and isn't intimidating. Um, thank you, Sophia. Would you like to say, to kind of speak directly to us? Do you want to unmute and add anything? I can a little bit, but yeah. I, I think what you said was really like the crux of that, where I just think that, I think that comedy is a thing that everyone enjoys and everyone can relate on. And I, although I hate thinking about the business side of theater, it's the part that I dread, but it's like, you have to get people to come see your things if you want to portray a message. And there needs to be that kind of relief and catharsis for people. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I've just found in my own daily thing where I'm talking to my friends being like, hey, you wanna come see my show? And they're like, what's it about? And I'm like, oh, it's a very dramatic, serious thing. And they're like, oh, sorry, I have plans tonight. Or if I'm like, oh, it's like, it's like a comedic thing. Like it's about a serious topic, but we kind of like make light of it. They're like, oh yeah, I'll definitely come. So I think there has to be kind of the thought of that. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. Thank you, Sophia. And we can have I, also... can I speak to that a little? Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, right, minutes, um, I think that's okay. a, you raise a great point there. Um, and it, it refers also to uh, what I think Wafa was saying earlier. In other words, that, you know, when you are when you are being funny, you are kind of creating some sort of psychic tension in the mind of your audience. And that can that has a lot of power, yeah. And so you can use that in many different ways. So I'm sure, although I don't know anything about it, but I'm sure there are people out there making horrible jokes and making rooms full of other horrible people laugh out loud. Um, and yet there are other places where people are making lots of people who might otherwise be disempowered laugh out loud. See what I'm saying? That that what you're yeah. dealing with in comedy, I think, is a kind of manipulation of the of the psyche of the audience. And your use of the term um, catharsis is, of course, directly feeds right into those um, psychological theories. Yeah, I, I want to add one uh, just small thing. Even the most serious production, there is always comic relief in it and it's built for a reason in any production whether it is theater short feature there is comic relief punctuating that script and it's for a reason because it comes a point when we cannot take it any, any longer it's too much then we need a break and the break comes in a comic relief Um, th that opens up lots of thoughts for me, and I want to take a moment just to go back to this idea that you, um, not idea, like the thought, the feeling that you've had in 2007, you said when Iraqis stopped laughing, because mm -hmm. as a Lebanese who's lived in Lebanon most of my life, and you know, kind of Lebanese are famous for cracking jokes about every little and small and big and, you know, think as, as way of dealing with um, you know the circumstances recently and I want to say like probably after the the explosion in 2020 I I'm fed up I like I feel I'm fed up with with laughing about the situation mm -hmm. and here's like the pushback I want to or like just an, an idea I want to throw and and get your thoughts on it uh, Wafa and also Sammy and Simon this catharsis in my mind, sometimes can be dangerous because we're, we're, you know, we feel like he, it, it, it releases some of the anger that we need really to do something that would lead to a, a change that we need in our situation. So one, so I'm as, as a, just an individual in this time in my life, I'm not able to laugh at things that I used to laugh about in Lebanon in particular. It's not it I can't find I can't I can't find it funny anymore. I'm done. Like I'm I don't want to be resilient. I don't want to be uh, cracking jokes about it. I don't want to heal that way. I yeah. want the anger to be really big enough for us to like to say that's it. So I I understand when you say like it's it, it's a sign that we have no hope when we stop laughing. At the same time, I want to say, like, maybe actually there is hope that we stop laughing because now we're going to be trying something else to deal with the situation. You know what I mean? Yeah. So uh, great point, Sarah. Uh, let's uh, first uh, think about uh, it is not that I would come to laugh, right? But it's rather to, to, to engage. And I think that's a big difference between the two. Right. If you laugh too much, I think you, at some point you cannot take it anymore because it's persistent. Anything persistent for a long time, as a as a living creature, we can't take that. We 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 need a variation, right? So if we think of a laughter is a form of engagement, this changed a lot, right? Because it meant to engage us. And it meant to temporarily get in us 
out of a sticky situation and hopefully motivating us to take up on a bigger thing moving forward. But then it becomes stagnant if it all becomes about laughing. And I think it, it, it could fire back when we start laughing about the laughter itself. And then we start about laughing about our situation, how we cannot get out of it. That is a dangerous thing because it starts to strip the very power we try to build. And at some point we snap and we say, I'm done. Just like you, what you mentioned, I wanted to go back and fix it. But Sahar, that is a point of privilege. We would never demand that unless we have the power to do it. As long as we don't have the power to change things, I think laughter would become the mean to engage, but also it could backfire. So we have to look at it as just like how artists the trigger platform for engagement and that platform doesn't last forever. It, it is temporary for an engagement, then there is the outcome there you move forward. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot to unpack here. And I think some this, the comments we have from students, some of them, uh, you know, also resonate with what you're saying. That's my opinion. It's not just the answer to everything. Absolutely. <laughs> Sammy, I, I see you unmuting and I see a lot of participation from your students and I want to uplift all these great notes and comments and questions. So help me do that. Sammy, do you want to? Yeah, just, just quickly, I wanted to say something. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I understand where Wafa is also coming from mm -hmm. and are you uh being from syria and also with witnessing some some of these issues culturally socially Im immigration um you know i i feel that you have yeah it's it's a balance like suffering is almost part of our daily existence and we have to like be able to laugh about our suffering to be able to stay engaged. I think something I now understood more after you said what, what you last said, Wafa, is I think the moment when we stop laughing at our suffering, we should be scared because it means we have become disengaged with the suffering. It's yeah. become normalized. We've, we've, yeah. we've accepted it and we cannot accept it. Right. And so like I think now when 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 you say the phrase like when Iraqis stopped laughing, I think that's something very, very real because it means they're they stopped being engaged. And the, the oh. suffering has become nor normalized. Sammy, that is a great and it goes right into Sahar point because if a lot of laughter it bring us to action and that's when you say no i i don't want more laughter i want things to be done but then if we stop laughing it normalizes that's a beautiful step sam absolutely i i i agree sammy uh, beautiful articulation of this thought um we have very little time left and i want to give a chance to the students' voices in here. Let's see. Um, I think we can say any anybody yeah. who wants to jump in, raise their hand, yeah. say something, please, please do, please jump in. Yeah, any, die, any question? Question or thoughts? Becky, I see a note from Becky. Or jokes. Yeah, or, or jokes. A joke, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, and I, as, as this Sahar, is sorry, maybe can, processing, go ahead. Can, can we pause 
the link for people to tell uh, everybody about the stand-up comedy show coming to San Francisco. Yeah, I, and please, if you have a friend, family, if you are there, yes. send them the link. Yes, I did post in, it in the chat. Yes, great. Yeah, and I actually, I want to invite Wendy to share screen with us, like show us the poster of this comedy show that Wafa is curating, which is so fun. Um, to look at. And do you want to say briefly why Amrika? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So have when when we when we uh, uh, decide we're going to do a stand up comedy show in New York, we we start stuck. OK, what do you call it? We uh, we throw a lot of things. And somehow I said Amrika, uh, not not even not even um, thinking about it because that's how we said America in, in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And a friend said, well, that is it. It's the melting pot, right? Then you could bring any disfranchised person and it would fit perfectly. It doesn't really matter who that person, as long as they wanted to complain. But look at this lineup, right? Yeah, yeah. Can it get better than that? All colors, background, that's, that's what the, the show is really about. It is laughing at politics mm -hmm. and bringing us together. Yeah, and I also want to highlight the fact that it's a very diverse uh, lineup of comedians, thanks to Wafa and his curation. And it, I'm, I'm reminded now of something you said, Wafa, in one of our, uh, again, conversations uh, about the show when you, you told me uh, something to the effect that you need culture weaved around comedy because it relies on, on the common knowledge of that culture. Yeah. And without that knowledge, you know, it, it won't work. And that's why you cannot most of the time translate. Jokes, oh, absolutely. Right? Yeah. So yeah. tell our audience, how do you think it will work with like a Native American um, Palestinian American, a Bengal American, and uh, African American on stage, like all these backgrounds and cultures. And they all walk into the bar, and that's the joke. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I yeah. really think it's uh, it is going um, to rely on the common uh, knowledge we already know, whether it's political or social. Yeah. Uh, these guys seeing the, the, the problems we see in a very different lens. And that's the beauty of it. It's a, they break it down to, to, uh, to allow us to observe it and not to offend us, right? Mm -hmm. And to allow us, as I said, they hold that mirror to see these topic, how ridiculous mm -hmm. are, right? Yeah. And I think that's the beauty of the stand-up comedy. It allowed us to enter topics and discuss them. Otherwise, we'll be so afraid of them because they held such a high power. And then what happened is stand-up to break it down to us say, hey, it's not that complicated. Look at it from this point or this. So these these. Um, it become entry point to any subject matter. And I think that's what we expect. We accept an hour and a half of non-stop looking at social political issue, but from a lens of a stand-up comedian. I can't wait. Um, we're, <laughs> we're almost at time, but I wanna give a chance to Simon and Sammy for any final thoughts or questions or you know anything you'd like to uh, wrap up basically with? Well, I'd just like to challenge everyone in the room to uh, think about it every time they laugh over the weekend. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. Well, Kevin, I would, I would say also, yeah, I think every everybody, it's, it was, it was really good to, be introduced and start thinking about this idea of what what does it mean to trigger a platform mm -hmm. and where is humor in that but also consider your objective as the artist mm -hmm. and am i am i using this humor and platform effectively because mm -hmm. that's what it's about rather than like question if your art is good or not right 
it's it's more about how how effective it is and and how informed you are to do to do this objective to achieve it there's a huge sure. responsibility in huge having stuff. access to triggering and guys go and support your stand-up comedians in wherever you are trust me yeah. there is no pleasure well <laughs> uh, beside theater right sahar uh, it's, <laughs> Thank it's, a, you. it's a great to it's a great thing to hang out go and have a drink with your friend and Absolutely. listen to stand-up comedian yeah it's really Absolutely. wonderful to uh, a place to uh, go together but uh sammy simon really thank you so much for bringing such an important uh conversation to the platform today i'm grateful thank you wafa thank you Sahar. thank you everyone i am thank, thank you so much all three of you wafa sammy and simon i'm so grateful and uh delighted and, and, to and Sahar, thank you so much for making all of this possible oh, thank and you wafa. i just want to take a moment also to acknowledge and Say thank you to the students, and I'm. I wanna, Jenny, um, Asia, and again, forgive me. I don't intend to mispronounce if I'm mispronouncing your names. Uh, Becky, you. I've read all your comments here, and they're brilliant notes. Kenzie, um, um, uh, Jenny again, and uh, Rodra. Um, apologies, we didn't have time to uplift all those notes. Josh, um, thank you, everyone. I want to also thank uh, HowlRound for always giving us their platform to live stream our No Summary Conversations. So up next on at Golden Thread is Amrika, the comedy show curated by Wafa Bilal here in San Francisco at the Brava Theatre Center. You can find the information on our website. Um, we're also getting ready for our signature program later in the fall, Reorient, uh, a festival of short plays. I wanna thank the team at Golden Thread, really like yes. small but mighty team, and allow me to say their names, Michelle, Sheila, Wendy, Heather, uh, Linda, and Saluna. Without them, nothing can be done really. And our board, uh, thank you, our audiences, our attendees here in the room, and also those of you who are joining the conversation on HowlRound, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, it's been such a great pleasure. Again, thank you everyone and have a lovely and happy Friday.